The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more. We like to do an energy audit, analyze the consumption of the building before we start trying to add on the renewable piece. So we're saying, okay, where are we using this energy? I like to use an analogy, and, and your listeners are all going to be real familiar with production versus consumption. But to the layman, I give this this analogy that uh, you know, if you want your vehicle to go further, the first thought isn't, hey, let's strap on a trailer full of fuel and let's get better miles per gallon here, uh, or let's go further. Let's actually see how can we increase the miles per gallon? How can we increase the efficiency of the fuel we're using? And then as a secondary, we looked at you know additional fuel sources if, if needed. So that's just kind of a little analogy that I like to use with folks when I describe the approach that we use. Are you speeding the energy transition? Here at the Clean Power Hour, our hosts Tim Montague and John Weaver bring you the best in solar, batteries, and clean technologies every week. Want to go deeper into decarbonization? We do too. We're here to help you understand and command the commercial, residential, and utility solar, wind, and storage industries. So let's get to it. Together, we can speed the energy transition. Today on the Clean Power Hour, electrifying everything with solar and energy efficiency. My guest today is Austin Carr. He is the CEO and founder of GreenLink Energy Solutions in the Rockford, Illinois area. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on today, Tim. It's been great getting to know you the last couple of months. Uh, we've been working extensively together and you have a very unique story and have created a very interesting company uh, in GreenLink. So I look forward to sharing this with our listeners. You might be wondering, how do CNI solar PPAs get financed? For many, it remains a mystery. For others, there's Conductor. Conductor Solar helps hundreds of developers and EPCs find investors, close transactions, and collaborate effectively. With competitive bids from high-quality partners, Conductor makes sure you and your customers get the best PPA deal every time. Free to use for developers and EPCs? Visit conductor.solar today. Tell us, Austin, a little bit about your background. I know that you're a military veteran, which uh, thank you for your service. Very proud to be working with you. And how did you uh, get interested in energy? Yeah, so uh, I was in the military from 2007 through 2011, and towards the tail end of that, you know, we started to see some of the solar coming out, charging some of the drones that we were working with. I thought, wow, this is really intriguing, really interesting, and uh, instead of pulling out generators for some of the power, that technology was just starting to be utilized a little more at the field level where I was at, and uh, I thought, wow, this, this is cool technology, and so as I was transitioning out of the military, I thought, you know, green energy, that's definitely the space I want to be. I don't know exactly what that'll mean, what that'll look like, but I'm, I'm very intrigued by it. Uh, so after getting out of the military in 2011, I uh, met my wife and uh, her father-in-law was actually just spinning up a weatherization program uh, for one of the contractors here in town that just got a contract through the IWAT program and uh, was fortunate enough to be offered a job opportunity there, started working for this company. And what we were doing is going into low-income homes, running energy audits, blower door testing, infrared inspections, and then tightening up these buildings uh, for the homeowners there. That would include weatherization, air sealing, things along that line. And actually, it's really interesting. Uh, working out at a job site one day, and a gentleman drives by and says, hey, I've got a couple units I want to get insulated and tightened up over here. I said, okay, that's great. You know, I work for this company, so just give him a call and talk to the boss, and he'll get you set up. Later that day, the boss said, hey, I got a call from this guy. I don't want to mess with it. That's not what we do. Uh, you know, we're just, our weatherization is strictly through this siloed program. They were actually a heating and cooling company, <coughs> and they didn't uh, want to get into the retail side of weatherization work. So I called the guy back and said, hey, you know, boss said I'm good to go, so I'll do a side job for you. And I actually ended up doing two or three units for this guy. Lo and behold, I found out, uh, you know, he ran an HVAC company here in town. The gentleman, the, the customer that had driven by, a small little HVAC company. 
And uh, we got to know each other a little bit. And he said, you know what? I think I knew your grandfather, Larry Carr. I said, yep, that's my grandpa. He's like, well, he actually helped me start my company 30 years ago in the heating and cooling industry. And in a way, this guy is my first customer, kind of helped me kick off and, and get Greenlink started. So after doing those few jobs for that guy, I was like, you know what? This is a, you know, I'm already doing this weatherization work. This is a great pathway for me to kind of dip my toes and get started here a little bit. And uh, that was kind of the origins of uh, Greenlink and where we first started. A lot to unpack there. You know, I uh, I work a lot with Amer- um, American Corporate Partners, an organization that helps veterans segue into the civilian economy. And so I'm just curious, Austin, what did you do in the military and how did how did that uh, how was that transition for you when you came back to civilian life? Sure. Uh, you know, for me, I, I joined at 17. I was real young, right out of high school. I just graduated. Uh, had to get my permission slip signed so I could go off to basic training and, uh, you know, joining and operating, you know, as a, as a younger guy, you know, from 17 to 21, I feel like it was a little easier for me to, to transition back out. You know, I had no clue what I was going to do. I didn't have a lot of direction necessarily. Uh, I knew I wanted to be a business owner. I knew I wanted to be in green energy beyond that. I wasn't sure exactly how it would look, but I, I did not take advantage of some of the the groups and entities that are out there now to help veterans transition, uh, going from active duty back to civilian life. Uh, fortunately I, you know, had a, a good pathway and was able to, you know, get right into a career and, and kind of build from there. But, you know, those groups, Wounded Warrior and some of the other groups that are out there to help our veterans. I mean, that's, that's a great service that's brought to, you know, the veterans and helps them in that transition process. Yeah. Yeah. Check out episode 184 with Yana Toner. She is uh, the vice president of American corporate partners. All right. So tell us, um, when did you when did you start Greenlink and how has the company evolved in you know in the last couple of years? Yeah, so I started the company back in uh, 2012. Uh, that's when our DBA and corporation was established, Greenlink Energy Solutions. And in the early years, we were really strictly on the energy efficiency side, the weatherization, the energy audits, building science principles. That's really what, what we were focused on. Um, you know, and we would do a lot of different odds and end jobs too when we were first starting off. You know, well, when I say we, it was me, uh, you know, doing our installation work, you know, some of the time. And then we would also be doing remodeling projects. The banks, the foreclosures was a big thing going on at that time. So we'd do some rehabs and just picking up what we needed to to keep, you know, keep the doors open, keep the wheels in motion. And in about 2016, uh, that's when we started moving over to the full time energy, the all energy. We cut out all the remodeling side of things. We said, okay, what do we want to be? Where do we see ourselves in the future here? And we said, you know, obviously green energy is the place to be that that's always been the focus and the mission. So we cut out all the remodeling work. And I think it was about 2017 when we started getting into the solar side. I said, we're going to start rounding out the company. The vision had always been, I look back at some of my notes from the early days and, and I've had these, you know, kind of business plans drawn up where the intention had always been building science, renewable energy and mechanical. And in 2017, we took that next step to add the renewable piece on with solar. And it was a slow climb for us. We didn't just jump right in, start selling jobs and say, we'll figure it out later. We were very deliberate about it, getting our guys NAPSAP trained and certified and making sure that we did it right. And so it, it was a slow start through 2017, 2018. And I think it was around 2019 when we really launched and uh, we're just going gangbusters, you know, had a lot of projects in the queue, started building the team. At this point, we're up to about 20, 25 folks uh, on the solar install side. And uh, our crews are very well known and respected, especially in the northern Illinois area. The focus primarily has been on the residential side. Over the last year, a couple of years here, we're starting to make that transition more into the commercial industrial space, uh, which we're really excited about. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So uh, again, just rounding out those pieces with our envelope, our renewable, and uh, we've also recently added on our mechanical piece too. And so those three pillars have allowed us to you know, round out our service offering and really serve the market in a unique way as we look towards electrification. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we energy professionals, we, we always want the built environment to focus on the megawatts first, right? The energy efficiency, the, the tightness of the envelope, the insulation, you have created a 360 
process, which I, I just love this graphic. Yeah. Go to usgreenlink.com and check out Austin's website. And, uh, you know, if you want to learn more about GreenLink as a solar EPC, please reach out to me. I, I'm very familiar with their capabilities as well. You know, the Illinois market, as you mentioned, is is booming. We, we have uh, a very robust RPS now renewable portfolio standard and we're going to be adding about 10 gigawatts of solar in illinois this includes large scale medium scale and you know commercial industrial and residential the full spectrum and that's what it takes to make the energy transition so austin you've kind of got these uh the you mentioned the three pillars the mechanical which i assume includes like hvac installing heat pumps you've got the envelope side making the building more efficient, and then renewable energy, making the building run on clean energy and re- reducing your carbon footprint. Um, and all of these contribute to that. But um, let's kind of walk through all of those, especially, I, I think, starting with the the envelope, that was your origins. And you're doing a lot of multifamily work, uh, including some low-income work, which I think is very important. And so share with us, what, what does that all entail? Sure. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about uh, something that uh, was really exciting for us last year. ComEd had actually launched a pilot electrification program for low-income homeowners, and they came to us and said, hey, we want you to be one of the two contractors in this program as we pilot this and see what the data looks like in the back end. Uh, Turns out that was actually a very successful program, and now they've gone formally live with that, and that program is rolled out to the masses, so we're excited about that. But you know, really, again, starting at the envelope side, because for us, that's our, you know, that's where we like to start. We like to do an energy audit, analyze the consumption of the building before we start trying to add on the renewable piece. So we're saying, okay, where are we using this energy? I like to use an analogy and and your listeners are all going to be real familiar with production versus consumption. But to the layman, I give this, this analogy that, uh, you know, if you want your vehicle to go further, the first thought isn't, hey, let's strap on a trailer full of fuel and let's get better miles per gallon here. Uh, or let's go further, let's actually see how can we increase the miles per gallon, how can we increase the efficiency of the fuel we're using, and then as a secondary, we looked at you know additional fuel sources if, if needed. So that's just kind of a little analogy that I like to use with folks when I describe the approach that we use. Uh, but on the building science and the envelope side, again, we start with that energy audit, running the blower door testing, which is you know a critical tool that really quantifies what the air infiltration is on a home. This is becoming standard practice on new construction and on a retrofit side, any of the work where we go into an existing home, we're always running a blower door pre and post. And that tells us, hey, at a 50 Pascals, the CFM leakage of this home is X. And when we're done, we wanna see that drop by at least 25%. And in many cases will be as high as 50% reduction. So if you imagine, you know, you've got a say 10 foot by four foot opening in a hole right through your house, right to the outside, shrinking that in half. Uh, and, you know, we also will have customers say, well, we don't want our homes to be too tight. That was a thing in the eighties with the energy crisis and they tightened homes as much as they could. And it would actually create some health issues and some indoor air quality issues for folks. Right. Again, that's another reason that we use that blower door uh, to understand what are the air changes per hour here once we're done doing our work. And do we need to add some mechanical fresh air uh, to the home? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, as you tighten up as you tighten up the envelope, it becomes like a plastic bag, right? And then you have to actively bring in uh, fresh air and extract the dirty air. And then you, if you can, you want to do energy recovery. So that device is called an, an ERV or an energy recovery ventilator. Uh, there's many different products on the market. I'm partial to the CERV, which is made here in in Central Illinois by a company called Build Equinox. And that device uses a heat pump, which is a little unique because then it can add yeah. uh, therms of, of heating or cooling to that process. And so you can use the device as a ventilator, but also as a space conditioner in the shoulder seasons. Uh, it's not going to be a full-blown furnace, right? But anyway, uh, let's talk about the electrification piece and, and the mechanical piece. You know, we're, sure. we're, we're at a uh, unique time in American history where... Uh, cities around the country are starting to ban natural gas in new construction. This has already happened in California. Illinois is looking at a ban. Uh, New York State, I think, has uh, got something on the books now. So slowly but surely, uh, society is going to move away from using fossil fuels inside our homes for cooking and heating. It's not easy uh, because natural gas is very energy dense. But you can electrify the HVAC system. So let's talk about that. Uh, how do you approach that? 
Yeah, so once we have that uh, building envelope uh, nice and tight, and actually there's a saying just to back into that real quick, we like to say build it tight and ventilate it right. So when you talk about the ERVs and the recovery units, uh, that's that's actually the the exact perfect approach there. So uh, looking into the and an ERV actually ties into the mechanical side. So yep. when we go into electrify a home, we've got the envelope right. We're looking at what are the BTUs needed to keep this home conditioned in the wintertime. So we'll run a manual J post work. Once we know exactly where we've landed with tightening the home, we can run this manual J, which will determine what's the heat load on this home and what's the cooling load. Typically in our climate zone, the cooling load is not as much of a concern. It's going to really focus on the heating side. Uh, you know, historically people come in, they'll throw in an 80,000, 100,000 BTU furnace just based on the square footage. They're not taking enough of the building uh, pieces into consideration to make sure that they're sizing that right. And then you get into short cycling. And so last year when we did this electrification program, we did about 30 homes and in all these homes, we were putting in air source heat pumps. We were using Mitsubishi products. And, uh, you know, as you know, we're coming out of this really cold snap. And so we were really excited to circle back with all those customers and see what their experience was and how their homes are performing. And we were really impressed to see that in negative 15 degree weather, most, if not all these homes were operating solely on the heat pump, which is, you know, the technology, although heat pumps have been around for decades, the technology was never able to operate and maintain efficiency down to those extremely cold temperatures. Right. And so we, we've seen it with our own eyes now. It's the technology's there. Our customers are loving it. And so if you get to a point where you drop below the negative 15, those BTUs are dropping off, you will kick on the resistance heat side to supplement those BTUs needed to make sure that you're keeping the house at the set point. And so the, the furnace, the air handler, uh, heat pump, I guess in this case, is really one of the biggest elements on the mechanical side. But beyond that, we look at the water heaters. We're installing hybrid water heaters where, again, they have heat pumps built into them. They actually are running on 110. And then you have resistance heat if you need to pick up that temp, that water quicker. Uh, you have that ability to recover faster, we call it. Like a boost uh, mode, right? If you have yeah, uh, if you have a gathering and there's more guests in your home taking showers, you want to put that. Uh, That's right that water heater in boost mode, right? So, cause the heat pump is going to, is going to heat things up more slowly than the electric resistance heat. Yeah. I hearken back to a recent episode of Barry Cinnamon's podcast called the energy show. So check that out. And he talks about his own experience with a uh, heat pump, water heater, overall good experience and, and totally viable product, but you do want to have that boost mode when you're, when you're using a lot of hot water. Absolutely. Yeah. Heat pumps are designed for a low flow, just a steady run, as opposed to our furnaces where they kick on, they'll run for five or 10 minutes, satisfy, mm -hmm. and then drop back off. Heat pumps are designed to just continually run. Again, going back to an automobile analogy, city miles versus highway miles. You get on the highway and you're just cruising. Those RPMs are dropping down. You're in sixth gear uh, versus in the city where you're jerking those RPMs up and down. Uh, that's a good analogy right. between a furnace and a heat pump operating. Yep. Yeah. And heat pumps are totally mainstream in places like Europe and Asia. Right. We've just been a, a slow adopter. We have, uh, you know, abundant, cheap fossil fuels. And so the American economy is just extremely fossil fuel centric. And we're when we're and we have cheap energy. Right. And so it's we're a slower adopter to this electrification of everything, which is much further along, especially in places like northern Europe. But uh you know, let's talk a little bit before we dive into solar and, the, and I you know, want to spend the bulk of our time together talking about sure. the solar industry and what you're up to there, because that's, um, you know, the core of my listeners are interested in that. But yep. but multifamily, um, you know, one of the things that I'm aware that you're you're doing is you're able to tap into some of the uh, federal and state incentives for upgrading uh, multifamily facilities uh, talk about that and what are the programs that you're working with and what is the opportunity for landlords who own multifamily real estate? Yeah, so ComEd and NICOR have a joint program, the Multifamily Energy Savings Program. And there are a number of different incentives and rebates that tie to this from the mechanical side to the lighting. I mean, the LED lighting conversions that were taking place real heavily, you know, a decade or so ago. Most folks have now converted at this point. Uh, but beyond the lighting side, you also have the insulation and air sealing. And so ComEd and NICOR funded this program. Well, the, they'll work with their contractors and their network. We'll be able to bring customers into the program. They can also apply through ComEd and NICOR's website. We'll go in there and do entire attic upgrades on these homes, ventilate them, make sure that the attics are ventilated correctly, make sure the bath fans are exhausted out, air seal the attic floors, 
and then get that attic insulated to an R50. And it's, it's really incredible. The land the landlords, you know, that's an investment capital expenditure for them. That's pretty tough. They're not going to get a great ROI because they're not paying the utility bills. NICOR and ComEd realize this. And so that's part of the reason they put this program together. And so we've seen tenants where they're in electric units and they're paying $300, $400 a month utility bills to heat their homes with the electric resistance heat. We go in and we make this upgrade to the attic and we see their utility bills drop significantly. And so it's a great impact, again, on the low income side. Uh, it's making a big difference in the community. And we're, we're excited to be a part of that. Very cool. You know, and then as we electrify everything, uh, you know, the, the furnaces and, of course, transportation, we're going to use a lot more electricity. I, uh, you know, I, it, it, it boggles the mind a little bit, Austin, that the utilities are are pushing back across the United States so hard against distributed solar, yeah. which reduces the amount of electrons that consumers and business owners buy from the utility. But meanwhile, we're going to triple the amount of electricity that we're using when we electrify everything. And so I just I just say to the utilities, look, there's plenty to go around. You're still going to have a viable business where you're going Absolutely. to be yeah. selling plenty of electricity. Of course, we need to make that electricity in more sustainable ways. Today, we're in the process of transitioning from coal and natural gas power plants to wind, solar, and batteries. And we have the technology. We just simply have to do the transition. And many big utilities across the United States and here in our home state of Illinois are doing this. It is truly happening. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more. So let's talk about solar. You got into the residential solar industry, and then you have segued into commercial and now large commercial and um, community solar. So wh- tell us about residential. What is your experience? What is your customer's experience? And what is the opportunity in residential and commercial solar? Sure. Yeah. So again, like you said, we started in the residential space. Uh, that was our primary focus. And, you know, getting into that, we, you know, we had lots of bumps and bruises along the way. We've worked with lots of different uh, manufacturers and different equipment. You know, we started with Generac and actually joined Generac's contractor advisory board at one point. And uh, I actually put a Generac system in my house. We've done a lot of battery backup with our systems. And again, moving through an, a variety of different manufacturers, we've worked with Enphase and Solar Edge and Grow Watt, Generac, you know, all, a lot of the big players in the game that we've worked with on the residential side. And uh, over the last couple of years, as we see, you know, the rec value on the commercial side, it's just, it's made a lot of sense. The ROI is there. It's so impactful on the commercial side that uh, it's just a no brainer. You know, we were talking to a customer yesterday and we're saying, hey, you've got a two year ROI on this system. It's actually a, just under a megawatt. And we actually quoted that system with the Chint system, CPS system there. And uh, it's it's really impressive, you know, the technology, what Chin's doing in the industry. We're really excited to be working with them as well. Uh, but this customer, they're looking at this and saying, these are what our cash flows look like. This is what we're doing here. I say, yep, this this is the way it works. When you couple this federal tax credit and the DG rebate and the SREX, you know, it just, it drives the whole market and really is making a significant impact on businesses and homeowners alike. Yeah, you know, a consumer or business owner can reduce their power bill by 50 to 75% with a solar array, and and even more with solar and battery. You're never going to, you know, completely zero out your energy bill because you need grid services. The sun only shines during the day, right? Your solar is only producing during daylight hours. And that's what the battery is great for. You extend the shoulders you use the solar array to load the battery or charge the battery during the day, and then you discharge the battery, uh, you know, let's say at four from four to nine, when there's a very heavy load on the grid. And so electricity yeah. is expensive when you're on a time of use, which is increasingly common uh, in states like Illinois. And, and so then you have those electrons, those solar electrons stored up in the battery, and you can discharge those into the local grid into your facility and and use them to power 
the uh, electric stove and the HVAC system, et cetera, right, right. which are consuming a lot of electrons, and, and then you reduce your power bill. There are very generous incentives. If, if you're listening to this and you're working in Illinois, there are very generous incentives for batteries in Illinois, $250 per kWh. And reach out to me. I love sharing with contractors and developers how storage works in Illinois and who are the partners that you need to bring to the table. So, Austin, uh, you know, you mentioned the bumps and bruises Okay. And and that's part of being on the solar coaster. There are dramatic ups and downs in the market, in the availability of incentives. We're in a good 10-year run now with the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. We call it CJA here in Illinois. And if if you're not dialed into your state's incentives, you need to get involved with your state organization. Shout out to ICEA here in Illinois. I am doing business development for ICEA, so reach out to me. If you're a contractor or developer working in Illinois, please reach out to me, and I'll help you get connected to ICEA, the Illinois Solar Energy Association, technically the Illinois Solar and Storage <laughs> Association. But what? tell us more about that journey, Austin, and it's early days still for solar. A lot sure. of people don't understand what it is. People are very skeptical sometimes. They think it's toxic or it doesn't work. Um, there, people have some nutty ideas, but what has your, what has your experience been working with both consumers and business owners? Yeah. So, you know, we'll I'm gonna talk a little bit about the battery side as I, as I get into answering that question, you know, I talking to a customer yesterday and they said, well, Hey, if we want to use our battery only during a grid outage, as opposed to offsetting that peak demand. You know, I think some folks don't realize the batteries have profiles built into them and settings. And so, once you install that battery, you can change the way that that battery operates. You can say, hey, I want to save this. There's a storm coming. I don't want to discharge this battery at all to offset any of my demand charges in this scenario. I want to keep this 100% full so that if we do have a grid outage event, we have maximum capacity to back up you know, our facility or our home. Uh, whereas in other cases, you can say, you know what, let's, let's offset and let's attack those demand charges uh, like you talked about there on the, on the commercial side. And so... Uh, you know, I think with just the technology being new, you know, that's that is part of the the journey and the curve on this uh, as we're educating our homeowners and our business owners about how the systems work, what you can expect to see from that. A lot of people are getting misinformation and they think, you know, this this technology is not right. Again, talking to a customer the other day uh, and she was telling me, well, you know, I heard from my GC that, uh, you know, that's not the way solar works and I'm still going to have this this huge utility bill. I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll send you a copy of my utility bill at my house and you can see uh, exactly what it looks like. And I'll, I'll, we'll log in together and we'll look at the back end of the system and see how that battery is performing and what our production and our consumption looks like. And so, you know, the technology is there. It's, it's been there and, and it's performing wonderfully and providing a, a tremendous amount of value to a lot of, a lot of folks, again, on the residential and commercial side. Uh, we have a commercial customer out in DeKalb where we did a large system for them uh, this, is, this is probably 225 kilowatts. So, you know, in in perspective to where we were when we installed that system, it was our largest system at the time. And this customer has just been absolutely uh, thrilled with the performance of the system. He keeps in touch with, with us almost monthly, you know, giving us updates on how excited he is and, and what the value that he's reaping from that. And he sent us a number of different folks that say, hey, we're interested. They might have spoke with the leasing company at a different time and, you know, really weren't getting the economics or the value that he's been getting as a customer who purchased that system. Uh, and so that's something where, you know, there's a variety of different ways to, to finance or put these systems together, where, whether it's a PPA, a lease, a purchase, number of different options there. But uh, in this case, it was a purchase and, and he's got uh, the incredible results that he expected and quite frankly, even a little better than we projected, which is great. We try to be conservative uh, on our modeling to make sure that we maybe under promise slightly and, and over deliver uh, is the goal. So, Yeah, that's always my approach with customers, uh, under promise, over deliver. And, you know, if you, if you hire a quality contractor who's using quality products and labor, you're going to, you're going to be very happy. Solar and batteries are a wonderful way to reduce your power bill, reduce your carbon footprint. It's real. It does take incentives. 
and, and good rules and regulations, because as we said earlier, we have very cheap fossil fuels. That is a barrier to entry. And we subsidize the fossil fuel industry hugely. Um, and then the other angle to this that we haven't talked about is the human health aspect. You did mention that around the built in, I mean, the, the, the envelope, right? When you tighten the envelope, you, you don't want buildup of CO2. And, and I, I recently installed an air, an air quality moni- monitor. It's called a, a kingpin, kingpin. Okay. It's, a, it's a weird spelling, Q-I-N-P-I or Q-I-N-G-P-I-N-G. Um, wonderful little device, though. It's, it's uh, Wi-Fi connected, and it gives me you know, uh, the PPMs of CO2. It also looks at the uh, particulate matter, uh, the PM 2.5. So these are micro, uh, microscopic, you know, particles in the, in the air. And then, uh, you know, temperature, humidity, and VOCs. Those are, those are the other things you need to be careful about is buildup of, of volatile organic compounds. So anyway, back to the solar industry, you're, you're riding this this wave of of expansion of the distributed generation or the CNI solar industry uh, here in Illinois. You're also working in southern Wisconsin, and you know we we have a much more robust market for distributed generation here in Illinois than we do in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, there's it's just different. You see more uh, utility work, utility scale solar, not so much uh, DG and in. in in bits and pieces, uh, there are local pockets, and it, it'll it'll get there in time. Uh, all the Midwest is is coming along slowly behind us. You know, first was Minnesota uh, with their community solar, then Illinois. Now we've kind of eclipsed Minnesota. They're they're fighting their way back. Uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, they're all in the in the wings, and it's just a matter of of when, not if, they're going to have robust distributed generation and community solar. Uh, economies as well. So what else, you know, I guess, Austin, should our energy professional listeners and prosumers, you know, these are business owners and consumers who want to understand how solar works. What should they know about, you know, going solar? Sure. Well, there's a couple of things, you know, that come right to my mind. We talk about how the incentives are driving the market, Uh, you know, the adjustable block program, uh, which is under the Illinois Shines program, is funding and, and incentivizing folks to go solar. You talked about it on your podcast the other day about uh, renewable energy credits equal one megawatt hour production. And so uh, when we look at that, that that's an important factor. And those incentives are scheduled to tear down here. Later this year, uh, in 2024, we're going to be going to a lower block rate, which, uh, you know, will slightly impact the the ROI in a system, but it will still be, you know, a significant driver in, in encouraging people to go solar. And also with the net metering side, understanding what net metering is and what that looks like, particularly on the residential side, we're going to be going to, and you spoke about with the utilities kind of shifting things a little bit, going to net metering 2.0. We know California is on net metering 3.0, which really pushes more towards that storage space. So I would really uh, encourage consumers to consider the storage side. I think that's really important to, to take a look at that. If you're going solar, it can be a large upfront cost, but if you look at the system over the life uh, of 25 years plus, that storage in almost every case will more than pay for itself, especially on the CNI side. Uh, you know, working with intelligent generations here on a couple of projects that we're uh, we're exploring for our customers. They've got incredible technology and bringing an amazing product to the market. Where really, Jared, our CRO, talks about is you know a cash box, a little printing cash machine out there for the customers. You're really generating and driving revenue uh, from your solar. Aside from just the expense side, where you're saving you're actually creating cash flow there on the battery side. So really keeping an eye on the battery and the storage, I think is really important moving forward into 2024, 2025 and beyond. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, you mentioned this value stack of storage. Solar is very, very one dimensional, right? It's either on or off. It's either producing electrons when the sun is shining or it's not. A battery is more three dimensional. It can be used for a variety of services. Of course, we've talked about, you know, reducing your load during certain times of day and thereby reducing your bill, right? Your, your, the battery is becoming your grid during certain times of the day. It's also there for resiliency. If there's a grid outage and you have the hardware installed to island from the grid, 
So basically, there's a switch that is sensing if there's grid power. When the grid goes down, the switch flips, and then you go into island mode. And, you know, you need a battery to operate in island mode, right? You cannot island from the grid and right. use your local solar energy if you don't have a battery. So this is another common misperception of consumers. They think, oh, if I get solar, I'll have uh, resiliency. Not true. You need a battery in the hardware to island from the grid. And then you do have resiliency to some level. Uh, you would typically uh, attack certain critical loads, we call them, right? So you have a separate panel that is used when you're in island mode. You keep the refrigerator going. You keep the HVAC running or whatever is, is critical for you. you obviously, some power, uh, the Wi-Fi, et cetera. So, um, and then there's grid services. Things, uh, you know, things like frequency regulation, which is something that the grid operator really wants. And, and the battery is a conditioning device, it could also be used as a virtual power plant where uh, you're signing up, so to speak, to put your battery in as a resource for this larger agglomeration of other batteries. And that together is being used by the utility to reduce the amount of energy they need to produce with power plants like peaker plants that are very expensive. So when you have a capacity day, a very uh, hot summer day, say, and those peaker plants are getting turned on. The peaker plants only run at those times when the, when the grid is really humming, and that electricity is more expensive. And if you're a large commercial consumer of electricity, that could be upwards of 30% of your bill, the, what we call capacity charges. And so you can then use the battery to attack those specific days. And you have to work with partners, software, software as a service providers like Intelligent Generation. Shout out to Mark Thrum and David Braun. We're going to have David on the show here in the coming weeks, so you can look forward to that. They're a software as a service for making the battery talk to the grid in commercial applications. They don't work in the residential space, but in, uh, you know, we're talking a 500 kW to several megawatts scale battery. And, and it truly is a game changer. It can also provide services like ride through. If you're a manufacturer and you're doing uh, injection molding, for example, and the grid flickers, there's a brownout, the equipment goes, oh, I can't operate and I'm going to do what's called an uncontrolled shutdown. Having a battery, the switch flips and you use the battery power and you have ride through and then you don't have an uncontrolled shutdown. And that can save a company tens of thousands of dollars per right. uncontrolled shutdown. So reach out to me if you want to learn more about batteries or reach out to Austin Carr, who is now becoming quite versed in this as well. What else should we let our listeners know, though, about GreenLink, Austin? It's been a real pleasure getting to know you and the team. Uh, very robust. I love this 360, though. Uh, maybe we could harken back to that. Like, what yeah. inspired you to take this holistic approach? Because many solar installers are, are still very, you know, in their lane thinking about putting solar panels on rooftops. And that's important. But you Absolutely. you also have to now become a storage and electrification of everything to really uh, even out the ups and downs of the solar industry in markets like California. Yeah, I think, you know, over time, we're going to see the industry go more and more that direction as well, where especially on the residential side, where solar companies are going to have to partner or build their internal expertise on, you know, the consumption side. And so, you know, you asked, you know, what started the 360 side? And again, 360 is the building envelope, the mechanical and the renewable piece. Uh, what started that? So as I was getting into the building science and I would talk to customers and we're going in doing the weatherizing of their homes and running the energy audits and say, yeah, well, we've just got a new furnace and, you know, we've got 120,000 BTU furnace in this 1800 square foot ranch. I'm like, there's no way this thing is short cycling off and on all the time. And so just throughout the different experiences we've had, we we would see that customers, they were left to try to piece these different things together. Is it the window guy? Is it the HVAC? Is it the insulation guy? Uh, what do we need to do here to either increase our efficiency or increase our comfort throughout the home? And so that really inspired me on the 360 side. There's a bigger picture. You know, somebody needs to take a bigger look at this. And so that's where, you know, where we came up with the concept, you know, and, and another thing that we think is really important for folks you talk about some of the value adds and what Greenlee can do for our customers. We have an internal policy analyst and, and what she's doing constantly is digging through all the different incentives and the rebates on all the different aspects, agricultural, commercial, residential, 
on the multifamily side. And we've created this in-house, we call it policy or incentive index that we've put together. And when a customer calls in or a lead or somebody that's just, they're just asking questions. We're happy to just talk with folks and point them in the right direction. Even if we don't do work for them, we just want to spread the word. We believe in, in the cause and in the mission here. And so if we can connect and add value to people by saying, Hey, you know, this is something you might want to check into. A lot of people don't know about the electrification program or the multifamily program or that batteries have the DG storage rebates. And so when somebody has this interest and they don't know exactly where to go, you know, they could always reach out to us and we're happy just to talk about some of the different avenues to explore and how you can bring these incentives and rebates to maximize the ROI of the project on any aspect of it, mechanical, efficiency, or the renewable side. Very good. And we'll, um, we'll give our listeners a way to reach you. Um, but before we do that, tell us about the future of GreenLink. I've been helping you understand the large CNI and community solar Great. market today. You're doing medium scale CNI, yeah. these hundreds mm -hmm. of KW, and soon you'll be doing megawatt scale projects. You're already bidding yeah. those projects. We also have a very robust community solar market in Illinois. These are up to five megawatts AC, which is 6.5 or seven megawatts DC. You can estimate that a megawatt of solar on the ground is five acres. So, you know, these are 35, 40 acre solar farms. And, and, I, I, and I have a prediction, and that is that you will be constructing some of those projects in northern Illinois. But tell us about, you know, how you're seeing this growth into the large CNI and the small utility space. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, you know, community solar in Illinois is a, is a huge thing. It's a huge opportunity, uh, along with rooftop on the CNI space. And so, uh, you know, exploring some of the different technologies, again, you hooking us up with CPS, Chimp Power, uh, you know, they're a big deal. Keeping that ROI at the maximum level. Uh, you know, we're excited to be working on some of these community solar projects, helping working with the developers, connecting on the production, the EPC side of things. We've got our in-house engineers, our electricians, uh, all the different pieces internally to support and work with some of the developers or customers directly that are looking to develop these projects. Uh, and so, you know, we just want to continue to maneuver with the market, serve the customers and, and add value where we can. You might be wondering, how do CNI solar PPAs get financed? For many, it remains a mystery. For others, there's Conductor. Conductor Solar helps hundreds of developers and EPCs find investors, close transactions, and collaborate effectively. With competitive bids from high-quality partners, Conductor makes sure you and your customers get the best PPA deal every time. Free to use for developers and EPCs? Visit conductor.solar today. Very good. Well, check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. Please give us a rating and a review. Check out the events tab. Uh, we are now doing a huge series of webinars, so check that out at cleanpowerhour.com. Just go to the events tab. Tell a friend about the show. That's the best way you can spread the word about the Clean Power Hour. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. I love connecting with my listeners on LinkedIn or at the website. How can our listeners find you, Austin? Yeah, so they can uh, find us on all the social media platforms at GreenLink Energy Solutions. Visit our website at usgreenlink.com, or they can give us a call at 779-774-3378. Wonderful. Well, I'm Tim Montague. Let's grow solar and storage. Thank you so much, Austin. Thanks, Tim. Hey, listeners. This is Tim. I want to give a shout out to all of you. I do this for you twice a week. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us your time. I really appreciate you and what you're all about. Uh, you are part and parcel of the energy transition, whether you're an energy professional today or an aspiring energy professional. So thank you. I want to let you know that the Clean Power Hour has launched a listener survey, and it would mean so much to me if you would go to cleanpowerhour.com, click on the About Us link, right there on the main navigation that takes you to the about page and you'll see a big graphic listener survey just click on that graphic and it takes just a couple of minutes if you fill out the survey i will send you a lovely baseball cap with our logo on it the other thing i want our listeners to know is that this podcast is made possible 
by corporate sponsors. We have Chin Power Systems, the leading three-phase string inverter manufacturer in North America. So check out CPS America. But we are very actively looking for additional support to make this show work. And you see here our media kit with all the sponsor benefits and statistics about the show. You know, we're dropping two episodes a week. We have now over 320,000 downloads on YouTube, and we're getting about 45,000 downloads per month. So this is a great way to bring your brand to our listeners, and our listeners are decision makers in clean energy. This includes project executives, engineers, finance, project management, and many other professionals who are making decisions about and developing, designing, installing, and making possible clean energy projects. So check out cleanpowerhour.com, both our listener survey on the About Us and our media kit, and become a sponsor today. Thank you so much. Let's grow solar and storage. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more.